let's look at application problems because that's how math is used in other disciplines. These problems are going to be where you have to read the words and formulate a mathematical equation so you can solve and get the answer. In order to do that, you should read the problem and understand what is being asked, draw a rough sketch because that might help you understand the dynamics amongst all the components, assign variables for all the unknown quantities. Here are some guidelines on how you decide what quantities get variable. When you read a problem, if it says how much or how far, how long, find, when, these are some keywords you should look for, and that will tell you what your variables should stand for. In assigning variables, use letters that make sense. So for example, if it says how much time is required, then you would say T for time. Sometimes the problem tells you what variables to use, and then you have to use those variables, in which case pay careful attention to whether they are small letters or capital letters, because that can make a big difference. When using known formulas to solve a problem, try to organize information in a chart form, because that will help. And then sometimes you have to translate words into mathematical expressions, as we saw in Module 1. Let's review some of that here. So is translates mathematically to equal to sign, sum translates to addition, product is multiplication, square means to the power of two, twice means two times. Substitute any known quantities into the formula and then solve for the missing variable. When working with equations and inequalities, solve for the unknown variable and always check your answer to see if it makes sense or if it satisfies the original equation. Also, see if the, the solution that you found makes sense to the problem that you're solving. Keep track of units throughout your work so that your final answer has appropriate units. And again, I cannot emphasize enough, please check your answer. And you should have some estimates in your head so that you know whether the answer you got is reasonable or not. Write your final answer always in a sentence that fits the question being asked with appropriate units. All right, so let's take some examples then. So at times, before you can do a problem, you might have to make some assumptions that the two quantities are related linearly, and most times they'll tell you whether they are related linearly. Assign variables to represent quantities that change or move. Come up with more one or more equations that relate the variables, and then use the algebra tools we have developed so far, or you can solve a problem visually so that you understand what's going on. So let's start with this problem. Recipe calls for one and three quarters cups of flour, half a cup of sugar, one stick of butter. It's critical that these proportions are met so that your cookies turn out well. Paul was careless as he started and put two cups of flour instead of one and three quarters cup and had added the sugar before realizing his error. Determine how much additional sugar and how much total butter he should use so that his cookies will turn out well. So what do you think we should do? I'm going to ask you to pause the video here and give this problem a try and then we'll go over it. So go ahead, try it. Let's see what you come up with. Assuming you have paused and come back, let's take a look. Let's draw a picture to represent the original recipe. So we are asked to have one cup. Here's one cup and here's three quarters cup. So one and three quarters cup of flour, half a cup of sugar, and one stick of butter. That's our original recipe. Now, if you look at the proportions of flour to butter to sugar, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces of flour. So let's take our sugar and break it into seven parts so you know that this one seventh of a half is the amount that will go with this one strip of flour. You can do the same here, and this one seventh of the butter will go with one strip of flour. That helps. That helps us understand what the proportions are, flour to sugar to butter.
All right, let's take a look at what Paul did. Paul had two cups of flour. So instead of one and three quarters cup, he has this one extra strip of flour. The sugar he already had added from the original recipe and the butter he originally had, it would be that much. So what do you think we should do for the excess strip of flour? This excess strip of flour corresponds to one strip of sugar. So we need one extra strip of sugar and one extra strip of butter. And so that would be our solution then. So this is how much butter and sugar we need in addition to the original amount of sugar and butter. And so our answer is going to be what then? We want to add a seventh of half, which is a fourteenth cup of sugar, and one and one seventh stick of butter. That will make the recipe come out well. Remember, we did not use any algebra. It was just a visual solution. In fact, when you're cooking, most often this is probably the way you might solve the problem. You're not going to get a paper pencil and solve an algebra problem. All right, let's take another example. The tank on Carl's truck went from a third full to half full when he added four gallons of gas. Use the information to determine how many gallons the tank holds when full. All right, so let's draw the truck. We have a third and half represented in the same tank, so that's why we have one, two, three, four, five, six pieces in the tank. A third will be two of them. So this is a third full. Now, when you added four more gallons, it became half full. So half full would be this much more then. So that represents four gallons. And so our full gallon, so our full tank would be four times six or 24 gallons. So that's our visual solution. Let's see how we would do it algebraically. Since we don't know how many gallons the tank holds when full, let's call x the full capacity of the tank. Then going from one-third x to half x requires four gallons, so that means what? One-third x plus four is equal to half x. And that's this picture right here. And then solve for x. So x is four times six or 24. So full tank's capacity is 24 gallons. Look at the similarity between this process and this visual process. For some people, one method is better than other. You decide which you prefer, and it does not matter as long as you can solve the problem. You should write correct mathematically if you're writing it this way. All right, let's take the next problem. Why don't you pause the video here and see what you can do here. Again, how many meals? So let's take that as our variable. Let's say n is the number of meals that Jen purchased. So since the debit card is dropping from 800 down 450 for each meal, and we have n meals, we're going to have the following. 800 minus. Minus means you're taking away 450 for every meal. 450 times n, and that is $71. That's the balance on the card left. And then solve for n. You know how to do that now. Go ahead, pause the video and continue. All right, so you should end up with 162 for n. And so that means Jen purchased 162 meals. Now, how do you know if it's reasonable or not? Two months, so that's like 60 days. Let's say you eat two uh, meals a day or three meals a day, depending on how many meals a day you eat. So 60 times 3 is about 180, and 60 times 2 is about 120. So that it's, it's a reasonable amount of meals in the two months, even though it looks like a really big number. All right, let's try this on your own. Pause the video, please. All right, so draw a picture if you can, and let the unknown length of the property be determined by L. So we know that the width is a quarter mile, and let's say this length is L miles. And area of a rectangle is length times width. And the perimeter is going to be two lengths plus two widths. Perimeter is given to you as 1.5 miles. 
So let's solve for L. And so the length is half a mile. And so the area of the property is going to be half times a quarter or an eighth, one eighth square miles. You should always write your answer in words in a sentence. All right, try that one on your own. So you have a situation where you need to mix yellow, blue, and red paints in the ratio of 3 to 2 to 4 to obtain a certain shade of paint. You've decided to make a batch with half of the numbers above. So half of 3 would be 1.5, half of that would be 1, half of that would be 2. So one and a half cups to one cup to two cups of yellow, blue, and red paint accordingly. All right, now by accident, you started by putting in two and a half cups of yellow and did not realize this until the one cup of blue and two cups of red had been mixed in. Should you start over or just add appropriate amount of blue and red so that you have the correct shade? So how much more blue and red should we add? That's the question. So go ahead and do that on your own. Pause the video. I'm going to show you a visual solution. So let's take a look. Here's our original paint combination. We have three to two to four. Three yellow cups, two blue cups, and four red cups. That's what's giving us the paint, the shade of the paint that we need. If you wanted to use half of that, then you would have to take one and a half cups of yellow, one cup of blue, and two cups of red. That's what you planned. You planned on doing half the batch. Instead, what did you have? You did two and a half cups of yellow. So before we can proceed further, let's just do what we did with the flower. Since I have two cups of blue and four cups of red, let's break everything into thirds so you can see that for every cup of yellow, you are going to need one, two, two thirds of a cup of blue. And here we're going to have one, two, three, four. Four thirds cups of red. So for one cup of yellow paint, you need two thirds cups of blue and one, two, three, four thirds cups of red. Can you see that? So you're just breaking everything into three so that you can see what one cup of yellow corresponds to. All right, so we originally planned for half a batch, which was this much amount. But then we have, instead of one and a half, we have two and a half cups of yellow. So two and a half cups of yellow. So for this excess cup of yellow, we need to add two thirds cup of blue and four thirds cup of red. That's what we have to add extra. So you can see how visually this will be the answer then. So add two thirds cup of blue and one and one third cup of red, which is same as four thirds. That will preserve the shade and you don't have to start over. All right, try this one. So let's do the first method. Two consecutive integers whose sum is 49. If x is the first number, consecutive means one right after that. So x plus one would be the second number. And so sum means addition of those two. So add those two to 49, and then solve for x. And so your numbers are going to be 24, 25. In the second method, we say x is the first number, y is the second number. Their addition has to be 49. And the second number is one more than the previous number. So now you have a system of equations, and you can use substitution method or any other method and solve for x. And again, you get the same answers. So you can choose what method comes to you naturally. That's what you'll retain the most. All right, let's try this. Amy needed 17 volunteers for her church fundraiser last year. This year, she predicted she'll need 25. How many more volunteers will you need? A lot of students will say, well, I can just do that in my head. And that would be how. You can just take 25 minus 17 or eight extra volunteers. But if you don't see that in your head quickly, so then you can do it systematically. You can say, let V be the number of extra volunteers Amy has to recruit this year. 
So 25 is the total number you need this year. And so that would be 17 is how many you had last year. So 25 should equal 17 plus the new number of volunteers solved for the V, which gives you 8. So either way, you can do the problem as long as you can justify how you got the answer. The second method seems a little cumbersome, but it will come in handy when we do more complicated problems. So it's a good start to get into the habit of being able to systematically represent how you do the problems. All right, let's try this problem. So again, let's say B is the number of buses we need to transport 353 kids. The maximum number of students in each bus is 72. So 72 times the number of buses should equal 353. Solve, and you get 4.9. Now, can you have 4.9 buses? No, of course not. So that means, what? Well, you're going to have to need five buses. You need to have the next complete whole number because number of buses is going to be a whole number. All right, try this one on your own. Now, there is no right or wrong answer here because it depends on what percent tip you leave. Some people leave 15%, some leave 18 some leave 20 Most typically, people leave 15% tip. When you're sitting at the table, you probably can visualize it. $45 broken into 10 equal pieces would be $4.50. So we have $4.50, 10 boxes makes 100%. And then 15% would be 10% plus half of 10, which is $2.25. Add it together will give you $6.75. Does that make sense? All right, next. another way to do it would be to just compute 0.15 times 45, which is $6.75. And so, the reason we are showing you the two methods is because when you're sitting at the actual restaurant, it is more likely that you will compute it visually like this and not writing out an equation. So it's good to have both methods in your arsenal of solving problems. So now let's take a look at a shoe store's advertising 35% sale, and you have been planning to buy $80 pair of shoes shoes at that store. Determine what the sale price of the shoes will be. So let's take our $80 as 100% and break it. So a quarter would be $20 because you're one, two, three, four quarters make 100. So fourth of 80 would be 20, right? Okay, now you have 35% of sales. So that means what? This is 25 and 10 more percent will make it 35. But if you look, this is the 25%. So if you want 10%, fifth of 20 is $4. And another $4, they'll give you $8. So that'll be $28 is 35% off, which means your sale price will be 80 minus 28 or $52. Sometimes people have trouble doing visual solutions. So let's do method two. So you're going to say what? What the sale price of the shoes will be is going to be your variable then. So let's say x is the sale price. So how did we compute sale price? Sale price is original price minus the discount. So x equals $80 minus 0.35 times 80, which will give you 52. So the sale price is 52. Last year, Amy made $45,000. This year, she made $48,300. What's the percentage increase in her salary? So anytime you have percentage increase or percentage decrease, the first thing to do is get a variable. So let's say P is the percentage increase. So you have to take the reference amount, which is the original, the difference between that and the new. So that would be 48,300 minus 45,000 and then divided by the original amount, right? So the difference divided by original amount. That's how you compute percentage increase or decrease depending on what you're looking for. And so in this case, what is the percentage increase? 7.3% because you move the decimal one, two, because you're looking at percentages as a decimal here. 